evening. Good to be back with you and I express my gratitude another time here for inviting us over for this conference this week. And I know I speak for both of us when I say that we're grateful uh, for your hospitality and grateful for uh, Pastor and uh, his family's hospitality in particular as well. Uh, we had talked about New Testament Canon on, on uh, Monday evening, and I said I didn't really get through the notes. What we had looked at was more from the historical level. So you want to think in terms of like a horizontal level of what's happening historically, looking at primary source documents and so on. But we'd be remiss not to think about that from a, a theological level. So the first part, we'll have New Testament canon continued. Uh, not a continued canon, but uh, discussion continued. And then we'll get off into a, in, a different topic of translation by looking at a very specific document about that. So some theological underpinnings. So besides this, this kind of uh, you know, what the the patristic authors are talking about in the primary source documents, I think we need to talk about some theology that's foundational underneath all of that. One concept is prophets, Lord, apostles. So when we talk about apostolicity, so even authorship written by an apostle or the uh, co-worker of an apostle, mm -hmm. even even orthodoxy in quotes could be considered in terms of apostol apostolicity, apostolic doctrine, um, it may at first sound like, well, this is sounding like it's based upon human authority then, uh, the authority inherently of an apostle. It could also, in some circles it does, lead into discussions of apostolic successionism as if then the apostolic authority is passed down so that these cities uh, then name the next bishop pastor in their stead who will have the same authority, etc., so I want to clarify uh, some things about that, that apostolicity, first of all, even in the first century, it's not infallibility, meaning that, for example, the Apostle Paul talks about Galatians 2, he directly confronts Peter, who is an apostle, and says, Peter, you didn't quite do that right with the um, eating or not eating with Gentiles who aren't circumcised, etc. And so he has no problem with confronting Peter about that. But beyond that, the primary source uh, documents in, in these early strata is where they would talk about apostolicity in a derivative authority sense, meaning Christ, the Lord, is the one who chooses and names the apostles. And so it's not an inherent authority within them. It's a derivative authority. So they'll have some text that will talk about the prophets look forward to Christ, and then Christ is the one who dies for sins and rises again. And then he promises the Spirit, and the Spirit comes upon the apostles. And John 14 even talks about uh, a promise to them that they will, he will bring all things to remembrance, what I've spoken, etc. And so just to show you some of those types of statements in the primary sources, Polycarp Philippians 6.3, Let us therefore so serve him that is the Lord with fear and all reverence, as he himself gave commandment and the apostles who preached the gospel to us and the prophets who proclaimed beforehand the coming of the Lord. Uh, if you go into the New Testament documents themselves, 2 Peter 3, 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments of us, uh, command of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So not quite the same order, but the same concept here. Prophets, Lord, apostles. So you kind of see that throughout various uh, pieces of literature. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separating the gospel of God, which he had promised before. Uh, for by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. So prophets looking forward to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who called him to be an apostle. We could add to that, Hebrews 2 talks about then God himself confirming the message of the apostles and those who heard them uh, with signs and wonders, for example, with uh, miraculous uh, events and gifts. And then um, apart from other texts that many people would quote, for example, uh, 2 Peter 3, 15, and 16, or uh, a case in the pastoral epistles for Timothy chapter 5, where it, it appears that um, it quotes uh, from the Mosaic Law, puts it side by side with a Jesus saying that appears in our Gospel of Luke. Uh, even beyond that, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you receive it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. So this is, if you read, it, read in context, and even this verse, it's talking about the oral proclamation of the message from God. You heard it of us. You receive it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you believe. 
in that belief, and it goes back to when he first brought that kerygma surrounding the gospel to them in Thessalonica. And so the authority there behind the message is God himself, and the apostle Paul recognizes that. So that's one thing to consider. A second thing would be composition versus recognition. So these are two separate events in the life of a document. So composition is the point at which it's written. As was mentioned on Sunday in the very first session of a definition of inspiration, inspiration, properly speaking, based upon the key text, isn't talking about the person being inspired, per se. It's talking about the, the scripture, the writing, being God-breathed. And so it's God-breathed at the point of composition, at the point of writing. So recognition is a different event, as it were, in the life of a document. It's as people recognize it to be what it is. So to be careful with our language, then. it's not, for example, that the church uh, or a council or an author makes it scripture or makes it the word of God. It's that at the point of writing. So it's divinely authorized at the point of writing. Um, but yet the process of recognition, if for another reason, because of historical processes of it doesn't arrive as you know one book in one location nicely bound together. Different church individuals get different writings. They have to collect them, and then they transmit them. So to think through the dis distinction between composition and recognition. And then to kind of jump way ahead in history to the time period of Reformation. So when the Reformers, um, Martin Luther, and two most famous probably being Calvin and Luther, but there are many other uh, Reformers, uh, Bucer, Bollinger, Ecolampadius, and all kinds of others, Peter Martyr, and so they were approached by the Roman Catholic officials, and they're saying, okay, you're, you're talking about sola scriptura, the Bible alone, but who gave you the Bible? The church did. And so if you're going against the church in their mind, the officials are thinking of the Roman Catholic Church, then what gives you authority to elevate scripture if it's the church that gives you the scripture? So this kind of reignites some canon debates about recognition, authorization, uh, type questions. And so uh, one uh, tactic that was common among the Reformation movements was to talk about an internal testimony, the testimonium that's within in, internally by the Holy Spirit, by God himself. So it says, for example, the West Christian Confession of Faith, so it's not the first generation Reformation, but later, the authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed depends not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof, and therefore it is to be received because it is the word of God. Yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof, is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. And so that, that language there after the ellipsis dots there, that language of this persuasion assurance of it being the truth and its divine authority, being an inward work of the Holy Spirit is the internal testimony language, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. Um, first of all, I would say personally, I don't see this as being in uh, contradiction to the historical happenings in the early church. So, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. We put this under pneumatology. That is, we're not the only ones that have the Holy Spirit. So believers in times past, have had the Holy Spirit as well. And so I don't think they're necessarily working against each other. But I can see how in the, in the context of the Reformation, because the claims being made that the church is uh, the magisterium that's going to tell you how to interpret Scripture, etc., that uh, you would kind of think your way through theologically how you want to explain that in the context at the time. I think the other thing to consider is that we wouldn't want it to then... Um, come down into some type of mystical approach of pure subjectivity. Like, well, I felt something when I read this text, and so if, therefore I had this experience of this feeling, I know it's God's word. And the reason you wouldn't want it to be purely that alone would be because, for example, Latter-day Saints, who would say, hey, here's a book for you. It's the Book of Mormon. You know, they'll knock on your door and say, read this, read it. And as you're reading it, uh, kind of perceive inside yourself, are you feeling the burning of the bosom, they would call it traditionally, as you're reading the Book of Mormon. They say, if you feel that, that's God telling you that that is his other uh, testament about the works of Jesus Christ. 
and the other scriptures that we are to accept. And you can even think how perhaps psychosomatically, like if you're, you know, don't think of pig elephants. What's the first thing you think of? You know, pig elephants. So like, don't, don't, just think through, am I feeling the burning of the booze? Well, well is it there? Oh, I think it might, you know, how that could be just purely a subjective issue. So I want to be careful about, I, I believe in this concept of the internal testimony uh, of the spirit in believers. And it's already, it's already there in the patristic text we saw, for example, about edifying, right? Does it edify? And are, are we reading it in worship in public settings? It's actually all ties into this. So uh, I think to consider that a little bit further then, two other uh, concepts would be self-authenticating. It's not a common word we use a lot, so I put up the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition, serving to prove oneself to be real, true, genuine, not requiring extrinsic proof of one's authenticity. We could even think of the courtroom example that uh, Dr. Stelberger used earlier this week. So it's not simply a subjective sensation, but it's the quality, the objective quality of the scripture itself bearing witness to itself, to us, and through a work of the Holy Spirit. So I think there's some guardrails, as it were, there. And uh, to kind of highlight some secondary sources that I recommend to you, uh, Michael Kruger is doing a lot of work recently on the question of canonicity, especially the New Testament. These are two of his book-length works, Canon Revisited, the Question of Canon. These would be much more on the theological side, well, at least many of the chapters are much more on the theological side if you're speaking to this issue. And then the question of pneumatology. So really what's undergirding, undergirding all these issues, one could argue, is the work of God through the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who inspires the text. The Holy Spirit is also the one as the Westminster Confession says, with the internal test, internal testimony in the believer. And then you could add to that uh, the idea of God's sovereignty, of uh, this outworking of that in human history. So human history um, in the church, if Christ uh, not only died for our sins but rose again, God stepping into human history in incarnate form, he's not going to leave us without help. Um, for everything that we need for life and godliness. So this would include the scriptures, uh, the inspired word of God, would also include the Holy Spirit, um, assisting and helping us as the paraclete. So those would be some kind of theological underpinnings. I mentioned um, uh, Kruger's work, and if you wanted some uh, websites to look at, the first one, I'm not entirely, I don't remember who put together the first one, but it's it's actually a collection of primary source documents and lists of canon lists and uh, <laughs> quotations from early church writers. It's simply ntcanon.org. You find lots of historical stuff there. The second one is michaeljkruger.com. That would be his personal website. The title of the website is actually Canon Fodder, but not with yeah. two ends in the middle, not like the artillery gun, but uh, Canon Fodder, speaking of the New Testament canon. And, uh, of course, I don't theologically agree with, uh, with all of his system on a uh, Christian systematic level, but I'm highlighting the nature of his uh, canon studies there, um, there on his website. So that, that kind of wraps up the theological underpinning to what we're talking about on a historical level of the, the human events and authors and quotations uh, from Monday night. We're going to completely change gears. And we're going to look at a very specific document, the original preface to the King James Version. This kind of allows us to talk a little bit about some translation issues. So a little bit of background about the King James Version. And before I do that, I want to review a little bit about translation and just really help us appreciate the labor of translation. Um, I don't know how many Bibles you have in your home when you go home, but isn't it easy to take for granted having uh, the scriptures in the English language for us. And you think of, there are still people around the world, and people groups who don't have the scriptures in their native language, or some would say their heart language. They may have it in a secondary language in their culture, uh, but not their native language, their heart language. You'd be so appreciative of that, that we have that in the English language. And I'm not going to use hypotactic and paratactic, uh, I'm going to talk about some very similar ideas, and we were talking in the car, we've been driving throughout the week, and kind of seeing what each other would be talking about. I think it's been very complimentary in various ways. And so here are some similar things that I had put together. It's not as simple as word-for-word -word translation. If, I know that, I think all of you realize that, and many of you are um, bilingual, or perhaps trilingual, etc. And you realize that... Um, Many people don't know another language. They think all it is is you look up in your little dictionary 
this word and what that means for this word, and you write down that word, and you look up the next word, like if you translate from English to another language, what's the next word in English? Look that up in your bilingual dictionary. Put that word in. Next word, put that word in. Third in place, fourth word, put that in. Fifth word. But translation is not at all that easy when, when you're moving from one language to another. So one example would be um, the question of uh, meanings of words. So what's the word trunk mean? I mean? If you're going from the English, the word trunk, and you're going to put it into another language, is it going to be true that in their dictionary there's only one word in their language that means all that the English word trunk means? Because what does the English word trunk mean? Well, it can mean you know, the box, the storage box. It can mean the back of a car, which is similar to those storage areas. But when you get to an elephant trunk, it's quite different than a box or the box in the back of your car. The tree trunk, which is you know, the bottom of the tree that branches outward. Uh, we can see a little bit of branching maybe in swimming trunks or shorts that are called trunks. The human torso or trunk, right? A little bit branching out if the limbs weren't chopped off <laughs> in this plastic uh, uh, a science device here. Um, but is, if, is there any language besides English that has one word that means all of those in their language? Of course, the answer, to my knowledge, would be no. There, there's not another language that uses the same word of all six of these things that we use the same English word for. So that, that's one example. It's not as easy as just kind of looking up inside a dictionary and then writing down the next word. Uh, the other issue would be that languages have different sentence structures. And this was pointed out uh, Sunday evening, I believe it was. So I thought a way of kind of showing this would be a very common verse. This is John 3.16. And uh, the red word highlighted there is just to highlight the, the top is from the text of Receptus 1550. The bottom there is from the Nestle at Lot 27. The only difference between the two is the inclusion of out to in the TR, which is the word his, but translations based upon the NA27 will still have his. They'll translate the article, the, before son as a possessive article, his. So actually you won't notice that in English translations. But if we were to, to translate this into English in the order of the Greek, it would say thus, for, he loved, the God, the world, that, the son, his, the only begotten, he gave, in order that every, the one believing, unto him, not perish, but have life everlasting. You can figure out what's being said because we've heard the verse so many times. But you also recognize that they don't necessarily put the words in the same order that we do in English. So a key example here would be early on, um, what's called a post-positive gar. It happens second. We can translate it first. But then you have the verb followed by the subject. And we don't tend to do that in English. We don't say, he loved God. Because to us, that makes it sound like God is the object, not the subject of the verb. So, so this example, simple example, using a verse that I think is well known to all of us of that kind of difficulty. Languages have different differing ways of stating the same concept. So if you have like a completely literal going from one language to another, so I'm going to use the exact same word order, and word for word, every word in the original language gets a word in the receptor language. You know, there are some difficulties, even apart from idioms, which were talked about on Sunday evening. So I have two uh, French examples here. Je me lave les mains means I wash myself the hands. But that's not how we talk in English. You say, I wash my hands. You use a possessive pronoun. You don't say, I wash myself the hands. Or, j'ai 20 ans. I have 20 years. But that, that's not how we speak in English. We say, I am 20 years old. So if, you, if, you, if your view is like, well, here's a French word, I need to get an English word, here's a French word, English word, you end up with some type of stiltedly wooden translations that you can make sense of, but it's not the way that we normally talk as we go from an original language to a receptor language. And then words have connotations as well as denotations. And that's a little bit harder to get at, at this one. So denotation is like the literal dictionary definition. Connotation is kind of the associations they bring into our minds. And uh, it'd be interesting, you know, to have illustrations from some of you, because you know languages that uh, I have no clue about, perhaps, and have never studied. And um, so most of my you know, limited language study has been in, in, in European languages. So I was trying to think of an example of this. And so in English, the word dinner, okay? Now, I don't know what you think of. Some people think of Sunday dinner which is actually lunch. It's around noonish where the pastor preached long. 
that it's one-ish or something like that. But it's, it's a large meal on a Sunday. For other people, dinner is always supper time. Like Monday dinner is not at noon. It's 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, something like that. So what happens then if you get like to a Spanish example of cena? So there's actually a discussion I cut and paste from a Spanish dictionary answers webpage. And so someone asked, so my questions are, does cena mean the main meal of the day, or does it mean the meal you eat in the evening or at night, no matter? I misspelled that. Or I cut and paste, so I guess they misspelled that. How big or small the meal is. And someone responds, well, cena is the meal you eat at night, and it does not have to be the main meal of the day. In fact, uh, cena, in, this is continental Spain, which is another issue. I mean, it can differ from continental Spain and Europe, and even Central America versus South America can differ on this. But in continental Spain, it's a light meal in the evening. So the big meal is the lunch meal. The cena, the dinner meal, is much smaller. Think of little tapas plates or something like that. And then to complicate it, cena is supper and eaten quite late, usually after 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. or later. So when they hear cena, they're thinking really, really late supper. And how do you convey that? into English, and can you do that with one word, or do you have to like somehow add an adjective to the noun to get across our idea what you want to convey into someone's mind about a late supper, or a late light supper, or something like that. So those are just some of the, the difficulties of, uh, of uh, translation. One more, words in the same language change meaning with time. So even in the same linguistic uh, framework, so in our case, uh, for many of us, uh, primarily English. For perhaps some of you, English is a secondary language. Um, you know, they say that if you know another language really well, you begin to dream in that language. And I was trying to think through that. Uh, when I was taking French rather intensely um, at Iowa State, I maybe had like one week's worth of dreaming in a summer class or something like that in French, but that's not me. Um, and, and my mom's Hispanic. She's from El Salvador, but unfortunately, she didn't speak it to us growing up when we were young. She tried to officially teach us in junior high, like a classroom-like setting. And when you're in junior high, you're young and foolish, and you don't realize what you're receiving. So we didn't take it as seriously Spanish as we should have. So let's stick with some English examples here. Um, so corn, okay? So this is from Matthew 12. At the time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. This is quoting from the King James. And his disciples were in hungry and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. And I can remember uh, being a young person at a, a church in Iowa. There's this guest speaker who came through, and he quoted this verse, and then he said, and you're all from Iowa. You know how this works. You take the ear of corn. I can remember him actually saying it's like a typewriter, which is a whole other discussion, right? We don't have those anymore. And he's you know, playing around with an ear of corn. Of course, this is not what is meant, because that maize corn is a new world agricultural product that wasn't in their old world until the Europeans came. So in the 1600s, the word corn simply meant grain. And so it's like a barley or a wheat or something like that, which would be a much smaller, it wouldn't be like a big ear of corn, even there, uh, because of the wonders of modernity, our ears of corn have more kernels on them than they would have uh, in the 1600s. So, you know, it's a slight difference there of how we think of the word, perhaps. The word conversation, I think all of you, uh, many of you are, are cognizant of this, that in the King James, when you hear conversation, perhaps uh, the common person today would hear, like, the way we talk. But, in fact, it tended to mean the way you live, like your conduct. So having your conversation honest among the Gentiles may at first sound like the way you talk, like, you know, speak honestly. But as the rest of the verse makes clear, that whereas they speak against you as evil little, that is, the others are speaking, they may by your good works, that is, your life and your conduct, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Another one would be to prevent, which to us means like to hold back, to stop. So when it comes to 1 Thessalonians 4.15, the eschatological text, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, asleep being a euphemism for those who have passed away and died, so without the understanding, it makes it sound like as if you're like holding them back, like you can't, you can't go <laughs> in the second coming of Christ. I'm going to prevent you, but in fact, it's from prewenio to go before, going back to Latin, and so to proceed is what's meant. That they, that those who are alive will not precede those which are asleep, or as some have joked, that they need six feet of head start because you know they have passed away and and uh, have been buried, perhaps, and so on. So, um, but the point being is the change of language. 
uh, that inside the same language structure, sometimes words change in meaning. So we can be grateful. It's, it's a difficult task. It's a hard task to go uh, into a major work um, and one that you care for and are committed to, like the scriptures, and to translate them. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, we could be appreciative of translation work as seen through the discussion of the preface to the King James Bible. So King James was the King James VI of Scotland, and he came to the throne in 1567 of Scotland as the sixth. He came to the throne of England in 1603 as King James I. He had earlier tried to establish Episcopalianism in Scotland, and he had disliked the Geneva Bible in particular because it tended to be more leaning toward Presbyterian polity, not Episcopalian. The Geneva Bible had been the Bible of John Bunyan, John Milton, William Shakespeare, and the Pilgrims, uh, the, the previous Geneva Bible. Well, one year after he came to the throne in England, he was here at Hampton Court in England. And he was there in January of 1604. And it was a, group, a minority group of Puritans wanted to purify the church and, and, and to remake it more biblical, get rid of some of the trappings of Roman Catholicism. And they were led by a man named Dr. John Reynolds. He was president of Corpus Christi College, one of the colleges, constituent colleges at Oxford. And on January 16th, although he had been ridiculed and scorned by others there at Hampton Court, Reynolds said he could not in good conscience use uh, the, the common communion book because the Bible uh, translation was using, he thought, was not the best translation. And he suggested to the king that they do a new translation. And he gave some examples, like in Psalm 106, verse 30, the Bishop's Bible had said, then stood up Phineas and prayed. Reynolds argued that it should have been translated, then stood up Phineas and executed judgment, which is actually what it does say in the King James Version now. And perhaps the surprise of some, the king agreed. The king is, was not a Puritan, actually. Uh, but he agreed with this, and six committees were set up, two at Cambridge, two at Oxford, two at Westminster in London. And beyond that, after their work was done, they sent it on to a revision committee at Stationers Hall. And as one primary source document says, in certain places, whole chapters have remained untouched. And generally, the revisers reworked at the most, only a few verses in each chapter, so it wasn't necessarily a heavy revision. Then beyond that, it was sent on to Bishop Thomas Bilson and Dr. Miles Smith for further review. And Dr. Miles Smith is the author of the translator to the reader preface that we're concentrating on tonight. And finally, Archbishop Bancroft made 14 final changes. Not a lot, but 14. Mm -hmm. Then it was sent on to Robert Barker, who was a personal printer of the King. And it came out, of course, as we know, in 1611. One of the early editions, one of the fun stories about uh, the King James in 1611 is one of the early editions is called the He version of the Bible. Because in Ruth 3.15, it said, and he went into the city. But clearly in context, it it's, should have been she. And so when they changed that later in the next edition, it was named the She Bible. And I can guarantee if you owned a copy of the He Bible, it would be worth a lot of money. It's, it's a collector's classic uh, to have a copy of the He Bible. What we want to concentrate on is the preface to the translator, the translators to the readers, it's called. It's 11 pages long. Interestingly, sometimes it itself quotes the Geneva Bible. So the preface to the King James quotes the Geneva translation inside this preface at times. And before that, there's an epistolary dedication to King James saying, thank you so much. In God's providence, you agreed. Uh, it's basically explaining why it took uh, seven years to get the project done. It's a long project. And so it kind of spells that out, and then it kind of explains a little bit about the translation. So I, I kind of put five points together here. Um, if you were interested in some, uh, some secondary source documents, I've actually brought some here this evening and could point those your way. Actually, Dr. Snowberger's seminary, uh, Detroit Baptist Seminary Journal, had a really good article about this I don't know, five years ago or so uh, by Dr. Combs, I believe. And it was one of the resources I looked at as well in preparation for this evening. Number one, the translators acknowledge the works of previous or other translations. So they talk about this. They go way back to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of Hebrew, and they go to the Latin Vulgate. They talk about the Syriac, the Ethiopic, Arabic, some old, old translations, as well as contemporary ones, French, Dutch, English, and others. Although they're not mentioned by name, we know as historians that Wycliffe already had translated his into the English, Tyndale. 1526, Coverdale, 1535, Matthew's Bible, 1537, the Great Bible, 1539, Geneva Bible, 1560, the Bishop's Bible, 1568, the Rhymes, Douay version, 1609, 1610. And some of these are really fun stories in themselves. I mean, the Tyndale Bible and how they're smuggling Bibles against the, uh, the, the Roman Catholic authorities who don't want the Bible in the commoner's language, etc. It's just really fascinating stories.
But the epistle and dedication, which is even before the translator's preface, says, labors both in our own and other foreign languages of many worthy men who went before us. I had to make a decision here. I decided to cut and paste the original. And that's, that's not spelling mistakes up there. That's actually the original spelling of the 1611 preface. And they're talking about these, these other works that came before us. And they refer not only to their own work, but also revising that, which has been labored by others that happened before that. And they talk about to make a good one better out of many good ones, one principal good one, not justly to be accepted against. So it's, you know, they're being kind of critiqued for adding another one to the mix. That hath been our endeavor, that our mark. And uh, it's estimated that 90% of the wording of the King James can be found in previous versions that happened before them, such as Tyndale. Um, in particular, in Coverdale, Geneva, and some others. They also say at one point, um, and to the same effect, say we, that we are so far off from condemning any other labors that travail before us in this kind, either in this land or beyond the sea. And so that beyond the sea would be, of course, on continental Europe, for example. Um, and Tyndale, for a period, was in continental Europe, fleeing English authorities would be an example of that. And so they're saying we're not condemning what they did and all their hard work and travail. Now to the latter, we answer that we do not deny, nay, we affirm and avow that the very meanest translation of the Bible in English set forth by men of our profession, for we have seen none of theirs, the whole Bible as yet, contains the word of God, nay, is the word of God. Now first of all, by that last phrase, they quickly kind of almost correct themselves. When they say it contains the word of God, no, it is the word of God. When they say contain, they're not thinking of a neo-Orthodox theology like we're talking about Sunday morning. They don't mean that at all. That's you know anachronistic. And, and they, in fact, go on to uh, nuance themselves or explain themselves. It is the word of God. And what they're saying here is that they're affirming solemnly, vowing, the very meanest translation of the Bible English set forth by men of our profession. That would be people who know Greek and Hebrew. Um, and then they talk about a recent translation that had just come out. They hadn't seen the whole thing yet. That it is the word of God. Now, he, even here, when you hear me, uh, perhaps his example of a word, that in this context, we might hear like angry or violent or like, uh, uh, I don't, you know, when we hear mean, right? Instead of that, think of mathematical mean, like average. So like when the Apostle Paul says in the book of Acts that he comes from Tarsus, no mean city. He doesn't mean like it's not a city in which people, you know, run around in gangs at night and beat each other up. It's not what he means. He means it's not an average city that Tarsus was a, a well-cultured city. So the preface, the translators are saying that even the most average translation of the Bible into English set forth by men of our profession is the word of God. And then they give an example to the king. So they say, you know, king, when you give a speech before parliament and then one of your secretaries translates that into French or Dutch or Italian or Latin, and perhaps two translate, they, they won't have the same word for word translation, but yet we all call it your speech, king. So as the king's speech, which he uttered in Parliament, being translated into French, Dutch, Italian, Latin, is still the king's speech, though it be not interpreted by every translator with the like grace. But it's still the king's speech. So the analogy is it's still the word of God, um, even though it's the most average of the English translations. Secondly, the translators faced opposition. I, I say it's, this is reading between the lines, but it's not really reading between the lines. It's, they themselves state, we know we're going to get attacked for putting out another English translation. So that if on the one side we shall be traduced by popish persons at home or abroad, i.e. Roman Catholics, who therefore will malign us because we are poor instruments to make God's holy truth to be yet more and more known unto the people whom they desire still to keep in ignorance and darkness. So on the one hand, the Roman Catholics, they're going to attack us because they don't want the commoner reading the word of God by which they can then critique ecclesiastical traditions and say, well, that's not in the Bible. So that's the one hand. What's the other hand? Or if on the other side, we shall be maligned by self-conceited brethren who run their own ways and give liking into nothing but what is framed by themselves and hammered on their anvil. So on the other side would be uh, Protestants. So these would not be the Popish Roman Catholics. But those were like, well, that's not our work or that's not our um, chosen translation. It wasn't hammered out our, our anvil, to use the imagery here. And they'll be opposing it is what their fear was. Their type of labor deserveth certainly much, this is the preface translators talking about their own labor, deserveth certainly much respect and esteem, but yet findeth but cold entertainment in the world.
So they're like, we should be getting respect for seven years of hard labor of translating this from the Hebrew and Greek, but sometimes we actually find a cold reception, or in their language, a cold entertainment in the world. Many men's mouths have been open a good while and, and are yet not stopped with speeches about the translation so long in hand, or rather perusals of translation made before, meaning early editions that first come out as they're in the process of translating for seven years. Um, and ask what may be the reason. What hath the necessity of the employment? Has the church been deceived, say they, all this while? So it's an interesting argument. The King James Transfer is saying, we're going to be faced with a counter-argument that if this is a really good translation and you should use it, does that mean the church has been deprived until 1611 when we got this one? And so how does that work in God's providence? Like, if you're going to say you should use this, then what does that mean for the year 1600, the year 1580, the year 1570? 1550, if we didn't have this translation. So that's the second point, uh, that they knew they would face opposition. Um, and as an example of this, when the pilgrims arrived in the New World in 1620, they brought the Geneva Bible with them. Part of that is the pilgrims were not friends of King James. Uh, they're fleeing to the New World, right, uh, because of their very strong separatist uh, instincts. Even beyond the Puritans, they're actually kind of a step beyond that. They were separatists. Third, the translators insisted the word of God needs to be conveyed in understandable language. So they say at one point, happy is the man that delighteth in the scripture, in the scripture, and thrice happy that meditateth in it day and night. But how shall men meditate in that which they cannot understand? How shall they understand that which is kept close in an unknown tongue? And then this beautiful imagery here. I love this paragraph. Translation it is that openeth the window to let in the light that breaketh the shell, that we may eat the kernel, that putteth aside the curtain, that we may look into the most holy place, that removeth the cover of the well, that we may come by the water. It's just beautiful language, what translation does, and giving the people in their language the word of God, and then the blessings that flow, and, the, and the being enriched and fed, and their thirst being quenched uh, by the word of God, as they understand the word of God. Now, what can be more available thereto than to deliver God's book and God's people in a tongue which they understand? Since of a hidden treasure and of a fountain that is sealed, there is no profit. So in other words, if they can't understand it, such as Latin Vulgate, and if the commoner can't understand it, they refer a lot to the vulgar language in the King James preface. By that, they don't, when we hear vulgar, as another example here, we, we hear like crass, immoral. Uh, the word meant common. So just, it's not the common language. Uh, as more and more people knew English or a form of English, uh, but not Latin, and they couldn't hear that. And of course, the Roman Catholic Church kept Latin in their services until the Vatican I, 1963, uh, when you would have people who knew no Latin whatsoever going to church service, not understanding what's going on, and just hearing a priest say things in Latin and reciting back by memory, uh, even in response in, in Latin, not really knowing what they're saying, per se. Fourth, the translators acknowledge the difficulties of translation work. And we kind of began with some examples of highlighting how difficult quality translation work is. And translators, they knew this. Um, I, I know it would be correct to say that there would be uh, many, perhaps all, of these King James translators who knew Hebrew and Greek far better than I do. I mean, these were quality men who knew their language, especially on the side of Hebrew. My, I joke with people that I've learned and lost Hebrew twice. <laughs> um, because of my field, I use Greek a lot, I use Latin a lot, and then some secondary research languages, but I don't tend to use a lot of Hebrew. I'm not, I'm not proud of this fact. I'm not saying this is what should happen uh, as a graduate from seminaries and with that, but just to be honest, uh, you know, it's very rusty. And I literally have learned it twice. I learned it officially in classroom and then kind of lost a lot of then had knee surgery and for what am I gonna do for four weeks I'm as in a bed so I go entirely all the way through the grammars all over again and relearn it take some more exegesis classes um, in, in my PhD coursework and you know still have not faithfully kept up with it as I should so these were men who knew well the Greek and Hebrew languages or at least the one that they were uh, assigned to and they say a man may be counted as a virtuous man though he have many slips in his life else there were none virtuous, for many things we offend all. Obviously, they're quoting the book of James. Also, a comely man and lovely, though he have some warts upon his hand, and not only freckles upon his face, but all scars. No cause, therefore, why the word translated should be denied to be the word, 
or forbidden to be current, notwithstanding that some imperfections and blemishes may be noted in the setting forth of it. So they're saying we can think of a character and call him a virtuous person, or that's, that's like a moral example or an aesthetic example, a beautiful or handsome person, although they may have freckles upon, I'm not personally saying freckles aren't beautiful <laughs> and handsome, or warts upon his hand. I have plenty of scars and various surgeries upon, <laughs> upon my body. Uh, but they would say, you know, that, that's, that's still virtuous or beautiful or handsome. You could say the same thing in translation work, notwithstanding some imperfections and blemishes that may be noted in the setting forth of it. Neither did we disdain to revise that which had been done. At this point, they're going back to this question, why do you have another one come out when there's been previous English translations? And bring back to the anvil, the same imagery of the anvil, that which we had hammered. But having and using as great helps as were needful and fearing no reproach for slowness, it did take seven years, nor coveting praise for expedition, we have at the length, through the good hand of the Lord upon us, brought the work to that pass that you see. So they explain why it took a while, because we want to do quality work. And I appreciate the quality of the committee work and then the further revision. They're, they're, they're modest, humble men who are open to feedback from others as they read through them. It has pleased God in his divine providence here and there to scatter words and sentences of that difficulty and doubtfulness, not in doctrinal points that concern salvation, for in such it hath been vouched that the scriptures are plain, but in matters of less moment that fearfulness would better deceive us than confidence, and if we will resolve to resolve upon modesty. So let me explain that. They're, saying, they're, they're being honest here, and they're saying, there are sometimes we come across a Hebrew or Greek word, and we're not entirely sure what English word we need to translate that into. You say, well, how could that be? They actually give us an example. There be many words in the scriptures which be never found there but once, having neither brother nor neighbor, as the Hebrew speaks, so that we cannot be hoping or helped by conference of places or by a collection of places. In the Greek, we call these hapax legomena, but what they really get to, they give examples of beasts and birds. So you're reading through Leviticus of unclean and clean animals, and you have this Hebrew word here. It's the only time it appears in any extant literature anywhere. And how do you know what species of animal out there this Hebrew word matches up to? So how do you know that? Because you can't compare another document that uses the same Hebrew words. So that's the animal that, you know, it has this long discussion. So those are some examples they use that they say, you know, the, under God himself, because uh, they they believe this is a ministry for God, for, for the sake of people, the church, that we did our best. And we, we try to decipher what, in this case, bird or beast this is that is being talked about. And frankly, there still are uh, arguments about some of these words. Um, your pastor and I both have had a, a professor. Um, he, he's taught at various institutions, but he did his doctor dissertation at a seminary on the animals in the book of Leviticus. <laughs> and that was what his doctoral dissertation was on. And part of it was trying to simply decide. He grew up on a farm, a dairy farm. He loved animals. He brought together his growing love of scripture and theology with his previous love of agriculture and found a fitting topic for his final dissertation. Um, they also have some interesting other debates. I didn't put up on PowerPoint slides here, but they say we also ran into some questions in our translation philosophy. Um, do we come up with new words? Do we use previous words? And what a fascinating example they give is the word baptism. So they, they bring the question up, do we translate it? In their view, they said as washing. Uh, I might say dip, immerse, submerse is my that. And they decide, well, this is the accepted term, baptism, which really is not a translation, actually. It's a transliteration. It's taking the sound of the original language and then putting it into you know, English letters. It's not actually a translation. A translation would be something to the effect of dip, immerse, submerse. And uh, they weren't baptistic. So in that sense, it kind of makes sense, I suppose. Uh, they also give the example of the word church. Do we translate it as congregation? The word church actually is a loan word from Scottish Kirka. It has a long history. It doesn't even look like or sound like the Greek word ecclesia. It's, it's fascinating to read what, what they say about these things as they're trying to work their own way through whether to translate something or to simply use the accepted traditional word. Some peradventure would have no variety of senses, and that's in our word S-E-N-S-C-S, -S, that's how we would say that, to be set in the margin, lest the authority of the scriptures for deciding a controversy by that show of uncertainty should somewhat be shaken, 
but we hold their judgment not to be so sound in this point. Um, actually, I have with me, if you want to see afterwards, it's, it's not an original 1611. That would be too much to have our oily fingers upon. <laughs> this is a photocopy of 1611. But if you want to see some examples of marginal notes and what it looks like in a, an exact photocopy of the original 1611, uh, it's different script look, font, um, different spelling, of course. It had several revisions spelling-wise throughout the 1700s and onward. Um, but the original had marginal notes. And, and as an example, and is at Romans chapter 7, the text says motions of sin, the margin said, or passions, or passions of sin uh, would be an example. In Luke 17, 36 actually has a text critical note. It said many of the Greek manuscripts don't have this inside their manuscript, although it's found over in the text of Luke 17, 36. They actually have those types of marginal notes. Now, in such a case, does not a margin do well to admonish the reader to seek further and not to conclude or dogmatize upon this or that preemptively? So diversity of signification and sense in the margin where the text is not so clear must needs do good. Yea, is necessary as we are persuaded. So that, they had to defend the use of margins. So we're not trying to cause doubt. We're not trying to cause people to have questions. We're just trying to illuminate, elucidate the word of God so people understand it as we're trying to do as translators. Fifth, the translators were committed to the importance and authority of the scriptures. I, I just narrowed down like three or so quotations about this. The scriptures then being acknowledged to be so full and so perfect, how can we excuse ourselves of negligence if we do not study them of curiosity? And to us that may sound like almost a negative word, but actually it's a positive word, like desire to study, if we be not content with them. The enditor is not a word we use a lot. Um, it's like a composer. The, the composer, the text, the Holy Spirit, not the wit of the apostles or prophets, the penmen such as were sanctified from the womb and endowed with the principal portion of God's spirit, the matter of verity, truth, piety, purity, uprightness, the form, God's word, God's testimony, God's oracle, or the word of truth, the word of salvation, etc. The whole paragraph is too big to put on one PowerPoint. So that's a beautiful paragraph of their view of the authority of Scripture. So to wrap all those up, just looking at it from the translator's perspective, and I think these are actually good um, good characteristics and attributes of a translation, actually. What could we say? We could say that King James Version was a collective endeavor by translators. I think the idea of a committee is a great idea because you get to kind of check each other's work. It's not just one person's uh, ability or thinking about the translation. It's a great idea. And I think that they're right on track with the idea of having a committee. Committed to the authority of Scripture. We saw some quotes to that effect knowledgeable in the original languages, who are modest in their translation labors. I mean, they talked about those who came before them, and they praised them and appreciated their work. They put marginal notes on the side when they said, we're not entirely sure which was the best translation. Here's another option. And we're appreciative of the works of others. We have talked about how they were appreciative of the works of others. Um, in this case, the translation works of others. So in conclusion, once again, just a quote from the preface. And it's really a, a great way of concluding the conference as far as the primary source quote. quote. It remains then that we commend thee to God and to the spirit of his grace, which is able to build further than we can ask or think. He removeth the scales from our eyes, the veil from our hearts, opening our wits that we may understand his word, enlarging our hearts, yea, correcting our affections, that we may love it above gold and silver, yea, that we may love it to the end. The Lord work a care and conscience in us to know him and serve him, that we may make knowledge of him at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom with the Holy Ghost be all praise and thanksgiving. Amen. And so that, I think that's a prayer that we could close this conference with, is to study God's word, to obey God's word, uh, to trust God's word, and uh, to read and meditate upon it as we are not only hearers, but doers of the word. All right, so we have uh, eight minutes for you to ask Dr. Snowberger any question that you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I have, I have a question about when you talk about Hebrew mm -hmm. and, and, and my family knows I'm Hebrew from these things, but the Hebrew that Moses wrote, uh, there's a thousand years between what he wrote and the Hebrew that we have, like in, in Eli or something mm -hmm. like that. Well, I, if, if our English changes that much in 200 years, wouldn't the Hebrew have changed a whole lot? How would they know what those words meant and everything? I mean, in Jesus' time. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, one thing to say would be that uh, culture 
and the sociolinguistic frameworks of the culture don't necessarily all change the same rapidity of time. And so that, that would be, in fact, you have some cultures in which, an uh, ancient culture in particular, in which you have a written kind of language that's relatively unchanging. Um, and then you have the oral language. And so this is changing much more rapidly. And this is kind of like more set in stone. I mean, it's, it's kind of fascinating that way. But yes, I mean, you do actually have, um, in Hebrew scripture is a good example because it's written over a long period of time, unlike the Greek scriptures, in which you have different nuances, let's say. But um, even apart from change over time, even contemporaries can use the same words in different ways. So I'm going to re-bring an example that was brought up uh, it was Sunday evening, I think. Sons and children, okay? Um, so the Apostle Paul has no problem talking about believers as sons of God, huioi of God. It's interesting that when John talks about us, he always uses techna children. And Jesus is the only one called a huios. It's, it's not, I'm not saying it's contradictory like that. I'm just saying that they're using the language in perhaps slightly different ways. You know, does the author of Hebrews use sanctification, sanctify in a slightly different nuanced way than it appears in another uh, text? So even apart from change over time is the possibility of what's called semantic range even. So the same word can have a range of meanings. When you get connotations, it gets even more difficult on those types of things. But people talking about like the animals, they couldn't identify the oh. and, and, you know, we talk about Job, behemoth and all. Would, would maybe later, later people not even know what behemoth is? Yeah, or are there even behemoths later? I mean, that's another question, too. I mean, to aggravate that one, um, if you're living in 1600s in England, you know, an island off the northwest coast, the continent of Europe, you probably have less access to a continuous use of the word, I'm mean, just use the English word dog as a silly example. D -a -g -d dog. Okay, saying those sounds, what do those sounds point to out there? If you don't hear d -a -g dog in context of actually some creature running around, you don't know what, what sounds match up with what external species. Does that make sense? So it would be more likely in a geographical location you would know. That's it's great. It would be a great research question. Like, would rabbis, for example, uh, know more? And that's a whole other story about reformers actually sitting under the tutelage of rabbis to, to learn Hebrew. Because as they're moving out from the Roman Catholic and the emphasis upon the Vulgate, uh, you actually have reform, Reformation leaders uh, becoming friends with Jewish rabbis to kind of relearn Hebrew in the humanist uh, um, I don't know what word you, approach or whatever kind of relearning the language. So a whole other facets. Great question. Yes? Translation in English, like mm -hmm. King James Version, King King King, uh, the NIV, ESV, mm -hmm. uh, does something get diminished and uh, should King James be held up because it's a uh, image of plural? Yeah, so um, all of those that you mentioned were committee translations. So in of itself, that, you know, with it, which I think is a great idea, as I mentioned, I think committee translation is a great idea. The biggest underlying question you're going to have to kind of cut your list in half would be the manuscript tradition behind them, which, strictly speaking, is not a translation question. It's a textual transmission question. So to put this differently, you could use the same Greek text that the King James translators used and retranslate it. So the text question is a different question than the translation question. Um, this is going to be really simplistic, overly simplistic. Uh, but New King James and King James will side more with the King James with the TR, the New King James TR with majority text, footnotes, and so on. Um, and then the other ones you list would be more of what's called the eclectic text, which ironically tends to end up with more differences on the New Testament side than the Old Testament side. I say ironically because the Old Testament is older. But we have all of these copies of the New Testament. And we don't have mastery like people, uh, you know, counting the letters, etc. It's actually there's much more diversity inside of the, the Greek New Testament. Uh, your question about so does this lead to like doctrinal 
um, differences, something like that. Sometimes we'll hear it said that th there is no um, textual transmission question that affects doctrine. I, I don't think that's really exactly fair, actually. Um, in any given verse, how you read that verse with these Greek words supposed to be there or not be there, depending upon which manuscripts you're borrowing from, will affect what's in that verse. I think the fair way of saying it is won't affect uh, a key doctrine when compared with other scriptures. In other words, it's going to be someplace else. So let me kind of use some negative examples of how this might work. So you might have some would say, like, where is the blood of Christ? So the King James has, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. New King James have the same. Um, in this case, NASB, the New Century Version, and the NIV have, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It drops out through his blood. Okay? So the claim could be made, and has been made, that therefore the translators of these other translations don't believe in the blood of Christ and us being redeemed through his blood. Well, it's not really fair in that, first of all, it wasn't a theological choice of theirs. It was a textual choice. There are Greek texts that don't have those words. And rightly or wrongly, they thought that those texts are better, so they don't put them. But it goes beyond that because Colossians 1.14, the King James, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In the ESV, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, so it drops blood. But when you go over to Ephesians, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of grace, as King James. ESV, in him we have redemption through his blood. Against the trespass, core in the riches of If it was like this, I'm set against the blood of Christ, I don't care what the Greek manuscripts say, I'm taking it out. They would have taken it out there. It just shows it's not what they're trying to do. Uh, there's not, in fact, in their minds, again, once again, I'm not making an argument, it's rightly or wrongly. They think that when they're copying collagens, why do some manuscripts have it, some don't? That some scribes, they kick in their mind to Ephesians, what they translate a lot, and they insert through his blood, from the Ephesians text as they're copying Colossians. And so that's why it's there in Colossians and some manuscripts. And it's uh, why it's kept over in the Ephesians text. So um, and to kind of go the other way with that one, um, King James has Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. You could theoretically read that verse as, through the righteousness of God, like God the Father, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In which case, I'm not at all denying the King James translator believed Jesus was God. But hearing that, you could say, well, here's God, that's the Father, and then our Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. While a lot of other translations will take the hour as um, modifying the whole phrase. Simon Peter, a servant, bond servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who received a faith the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, elevating the deity of Christ. Obviously, it would be unfair to claim the King James translators did not believe in the deity of Christ like the NASB translators did. It's a translation choice. It's not a, it's not a theological choice um, at, that, at that juncture. Does that kind of help a little bit? Yes? I know in different languages, um, like love, it's different times, mm -hmm. but like English, just one word. That's all encompassing. So, is there like any known way to remedy that? <laughs> well, it's actually it's a debate. Like, if like, an example, of this would be John twenty-one, where post-resurrection Jesus comes to Peter, "Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my lambs." And two different words for love are used. And so, in in the Greek language, and some writers have made a big deal about the three different uses of of the word love, um, and. <laughs> Two of the three are coming to my mind. All right, so we have phileo, ag agapao, and what is it? Arao, eros, okay. So, and we tend to think of erotic like more of a sensual, pleasure-seeking. Some would say agape is like this very unselfish, and because our verse is like, for God so loved, we just saw that, uh, the world. But on other levels, is it possible that there simply is... Um, synonymous use of words for the sake of style of variety. Like, we're, we're repeating the same question, do you love me, with one word, do you love me with the other word. Not meant to highlight differentiation so much. We do that too. Um, 
and I know there are some myths about this. I used to tell students, you know, you've probably heard this, that, that the Eskimo populations in, in uh, northern Canada and Alaska, I forget supposedly how many words for snow. I later found that it's actually somewhat of a fallacy. It's one of those urban myths that came up. They, they do have more variety, but it's not as many as people claim uh, that they have. So how, how do you be fair to both? Um, some languages are more complex or easier, actually. My, my wife's Filipino. And to my view, Tagalog is like one of the easiest languages in the world in that it doesn't, uh, having said that, someone hasn't learned it, but <laughs> um, they, don't, they don't parse verbs the same way. They don't have masculine, female when it comes to pronouns even. And uh, so even my in-laws will mistakenly call my kids by the wrong gender. And it sounds strange until you, you realize what their language structure is from the way that they grew up. So some cases are more easy, some are more complex. And actually, uh, English is one of the harder languages to learn secondarily because it's a composite of Germanic and Latin and Old French and all, all kinds of issues. I, I didn't fully answer your question. And what, what I was getting at is actually this is a debate. When you get to a Greek, are they trying to specifically use different words for love because they want to highlight differences, or is it simply stylistic? Mm -hmm. So let's say in the Greek and the Septuagint, when you get into like Hebrew parallelism in the poetry of the Psalms, it's probably more stylistic would be a case because they're trying to synonymously parallel phrases side by side. Other questions? Yes. That's my favorite edition in this text. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I, if I speak in terms of favorite. Um, I, could t I could answer the question more on what I use. Maybe that's a fair way. To, and, well, let me preface this by saying I'm not at all trying to tell you personally or this church what you should be using. He's your spiritual leader. Uh, so you know, listen to your your pastoral, where is Joe? Listen to your pastoral staff, and here's your head pastor, elder bishop. Um, but I'll answer your question at a personal level. I tend to use New King James in my church ministry. Um, in college and teaching, I, I will rotate New King James use some ESV. I kind of, it's like a kind of personal thing. to get a kind of sense of my own personality. When I was in high school, everyone wore Nikes because Jordan Air were like the big thing. I purposely never bought Nikes. And in some circles, ESV is like, you know, the, the next big thing. And so I kind of have almost like, hey, uh, I'll use the old, the old CSB. Yeah, uh, sometimes it's fascinating to branch out like the old ASV. I mean, there were some two or three generations ago of really strong conservative Christians who actually, uh, you know, during the modernist debates, who their favorite translation was the old ASV. In the 1800s, there was a, a Baptist translation that actually translated baptism as to immerse or to dip, uh, which the CSB could have taken the opportunity, but, but didn't do that. So, but yeah, CSB, ESV, New King James, be some of the primary ones. That's just a personal statement of mine. Okay. All right. Thank you. Dr. Thank you.